Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas. This is your host, Ken Wise. I want to thank you for tuning in today for some Texas history. This podcast is being recorded and released in the summer of 2022, and boy, are we in the thick of it. It's 100 degrees every day around Texas, including areas where it usually doesn't get that hot. Problem is, of course, it's only June, so we're in for it. So I hope your AC is working, and uh, be sure and drink plenty of water. Um, I really appreciate all the feedback on the Merry Christian Burleson episode uh, released just after Mother's Day. Keep it coming. I've heard from a lot of folks recently about summer road trips. That's uh, We're in the time of year for that and uh, asking for tips and sights to see. And uh, certainly I have opinions on that, but my opinion is only one. Uh, But I'm always happy to help. So you can reach me anytime at host at wiseabouttexas.com and I'm happy to you what i know as much or as little as that might be i do love hearing from you hearing about your families your texas stories and your suggestions for episodes so keep them coming today we are going to talk about an incident that happened a little while back in western travis county now i spend a lot of time in austin for various things and uh, i'm one of those who can remember austin in the 70s although i was pretty young that's when I started going over there, and I've spent so much time there over the decades that I often join in on a favorite sport of people my age and older, and that's talking about how much Austin has changed and usually complaining uh, that it hadn't been for the better. We complain about the great restaurants that we loved being taxed out of existence by the Austin government and all that. Uh, it's become kind of an industry in Texas, but uh, it's always interesting to think about Travis County as it was back closer to the time that it was settled. So let's go back to shortly after the Civil War and get wise about Texas. All right, uh, why the banjo music, you may ask? Well, the story I want to talk about today and its background has its roots in rural Travis County in the hills and the hills of Appalachia, which sounds confusing at first, but uh, we're going to figure that out. First, let's talk about Travis County. Now, Travis County, if you think about it, is basically split into two geographic areas by the Balcones fault line. So to the east of that fault line, you've got Blackland Prairie and farming land. And to the west, you've got hardscrabble limestone hills. Now, if you want to see this, Uh, easily just get on Mopac in Austin and if you're going north look to the right and you'll see uh, the the farmland and the river valley and if you look to the left you'll see the hills west of Austin and of course if you're going south we'll reverse those directions now either direction you're going to have time to look around because you're probably going to be stuck in traffic Um, okay I'll I'll stop those references maybe maybe not um the early settlers to travis county really uh, gravitated toward the farmlands in the east they were coming up the rivers if you think about the 1820s and 30s as austin's colony settled and etc um people tended to stay closer to the water and uh, in 1839 when marabou lamar moved to the capital to the settlement of Waterloo, which he renamed Austin, there were there were very few settlers in the area. Um, the Comanches were daily danger, and uh, there weren't a lot of people coming. But the ones that were wanted to raise crops and raise livestock. So you had all that uh, land down by the river and kind of to the east of that fault line. Now, we've talked many times on this podcast about the German immigration that began in the 1840s. And they, the Germans, settled uh, further to the west, west of that fault line and up in the hill country. So the uh, type of agriculture they could engage in in, those, in that land was quite different. They moved past Austin. They, um, the Adelsverein, that Society for the German Immigrant, Protection of the German Immigrants in Texas, had bought the Fisher Miller land grant up near Llano. And um, 
they were moving past Travis County, but as they moved, uh, some would settle. You'd lose a few. Um, New Braunfels was founded. Fredericksburg was founded and, and on up that direction. So the Germans had already settled in the hills west of Austin and were figuring out how to make a go of it up there. So let's go back to the town of Austin. And we've talked about the farmland to the east, the hills to the west. Well, right there as they met at the Balcones fault line, that land belonged to Thomas Jefferson Chambers. Now, if that name sounds familiar to longtime listeners of this podcast, you'll remember episode 16 about Thomas Jefferson Chambers, a fascinating character in Texas history. If you haven't listened to episode 16, go back and listen to it, and you'll learn a lot. And one of the things Chambers had a lot of was land, and a lot of it was in the Travis County area. In fact, the longest-running piece of real, real estate litigation in state history involved uh, went back to Chambers' claim on the land where the Capitol building is now located. So uh, this was an active landholder in the area. And shortly after the Civil War, folks wanted to start settling on that land just west of that fault line. But what's interesting is who they were. Now, you certainly had some Germans in the area, but the newer settlers were mountain folks. They were people from, ultimately from Appalachia, Scots-Irish mostly. As Appalachia got crowded, they migrated west. Many of them settled in the Ozarks, uh, which, of course, will remind you of the terrain, the mountains and hills of Appalachia. And many of them found their way to Texas. And when they came to Texas, they found the hills west of Austin to their liking. Now, let me pause for a minute and just tell you that migration was a lot bigger than what we're going to focus on in this episode and went a lot further north uh, than Austin, all the way to the Red River, as a matter of fact. But for our purposes, we're just talking about the Austin area. So you had a lot of people ultimately from Appalachia, uh, by descent, coming to this area. Um, and so they, they knew what to do in those hills. They knew how to live, and they liked it. They were an insular group. Uh, they brought the culture of Appalachia with them, and, and by that I mean uh, a sort of a resistance to outsiders. They, were, they stuck close to themselves. They, the families and and of course you call them if you're talking about Appalachia you often call them clans um, would marry uh, intermarry um, they distrusted outsiders they kept to themselves and uh, that's who was settling out there and one of the things you could do in those hills west of Austin was uh, chop cedar and the reason is that cedar it's could technically ash juniper grew uh, in abundance in that limestone country. Not much else would grow, but they uh, cedar would certainly grow. And uh, cedar was much in demand in the 19th century. It was in demand for fence posts, uh, stove wood, wood pellets, even railroad ties sometimes. And uh, these folks would, would earn a living, would chop that cedar, sell it. They'd build fences. They'd build stone fences. Now, if you go to... Uh, I spend a fair amount of time in Kentucky. You see a lot of stone fences and, and in that general area of the country. And so they knew how to do that. Um, they'd sell charcoal. They'd make moonshine. Uh, they'd hunt and fish and sell their catch and kill and other things that they could do to scrape out a living in that country. Um, and so, not surprisingly, they came to be known as the cedar choppers. Now, um, before you think that a group of cedar choppers from Appalachia are out of place, uh, their migration to Texas really is kind of the story of Texas. I mean, here's another different group coming into a very tough place to make a living and managing to figure it out. These are people that were tough, just like the other immigrants to Texas. They were people that had a lot of ingenuity to figure out how to make a living off the land. And etc. So actually, if you think about it, they fit right in. They also made a lot of money. Um, cedar, I mentioned the uses of cedar earlier. It was the sort of peak uh, of the cedar business. And uh, 
ranching was exploding in Texas after the Civil War, and that cedar was needed for those fences, and there was a ton of cedar. Um, so they did very, very well. Uh, the best cedar choppers could could create fence posts at an absolutely astounding rate. Now, I don't know if any of y'all out, out there have tried to attack cedar with an ax. I have done so. And um, if you want some motivation to do whatever it takes not to have to do that every day in the Texas heat, go chop down a cedar tree. You'll learn real fast. Um they were making more money, actually, probably, than a lot of the flatlanders down in the big city of Austin. But they were content to live there, to live as they always had, and and most lived a quiet, quiet life. But the ones that didn't live a quiet life certainly uh, didn't in a big way. Uh, there was a lot of drinking. There was a lot of violence. Um, there was a magazine article in Texas Monthly years ago written by the great Gary Cartwright, and I want to read a quote from it describing the cedar choppers. Here's what Gary Cart- Cartwright wrote, quote, Their wages are the wood they cut in a day. They drive broken-down pickup trucks, deal in cash, preach self-reliance, and maintain a fundamental faith in the use of physical force, close quote. Um, that quote actually comes out of an article that Cartwright wrote about dogfighting, and the opening scene of that article uh, contain, or talks about a cedar chopper who had just stabbed a convenience store clerk, arguing about a five cent increase in the price of beer. So that gives you a flavor of uh, some of who you might deal with. There's a great book, and I'll talk more about it at the end, written by a, a gentleman named Ken Roberts, who. Uh, wrote about the cedar choppers, and he quoted one descendant of these folks as saying, quote, well, what he was talking about was he was talking about Saturday nights in Junction, Texas, and uh, this particular individual saw three fights happening at once, and his father was in the middle of all three of them. And this is what he said about his dad, quote, yeah, my daddy, hell, he'd get on a mule and ride 10 miles to get in a fist fight, close quote. So, um, they were certainly folks of a particular character. Um, now, how in the world, and if you think about Austin today, can you imagine a group of people living up in the hills and kind of being isolated and keeping to themselves? But it's hard to imagine for us now, but it was hard to cross the Colorado River uh, to the west, even into the 20th century. There were a couple of bridges that uh, washed out in floods in the earliest of the 1900s. And as dams started to be built on that river, the western part of Travis County became even more isolated, and that was just fine with the cedar choppers. Uh, The bridges we use today were mostly built uh, in the early third of the 20th century, really starting in the 30s and after. So Travis County, uh, western Travis County was a mystery to a lot of folks who lived in Austin. Um, The old timers in Austin used to say that you didn't go into the hills unless you knew someone. And they would also tell you never to go down Big Cave Road after dark. So that gives you a flavor for what we're dealing with. And that brings us to uh, this incident called the Travis County Dog Wars. And I'll tell you, I think this story, if you think about it, is uh, says a lot about Austin at that time and how East and West Travis County were different and separated from each other. But if you think about it and use it as a metaphor, it might tell us a little bit about Austin even today. Um, as Austin was growing in the early 20th century, people would... Uh, Naturally, people who wanted to hunt would gravitate toward uh, the sparsely populated, or they thought sparsely populated, hills in the western part of the county. And back then, um, when you would hunt deer, one of the ways you would hunt them is run them with, it's called running them with dogs. And uh, that became illegal in the 1920s, somewhere in the 1920s, but um, people did it before then. In the very early 1900s, it was very common. And a good deer dog was a prized possession and very valuable. So one day, two men named Hill, they were brothers, they got their dogs and they went hunting in the West Austin Hills. Now this would have been 
a several day experience. They would have gone out with other hunters. They would have camped for many days. They would have hunted and all of that and then brought all their stuff back. Well, you can imagine how that might create some tension in the cedar chopper community who not only didn't cotton to strangers coming in there at all, but especially if they're camping and running dogs and chasing all the deer and other game that these folks lived off of, much less shooting guns and who knows what other kind of hell raising they were doing. So finally, so this went on at one point, uh, this hunting trip, and finally the cedar choppers had had enough. One, one old time cedar chopper described these situations and he said if they saw they called them the dog men and these hunters and so if they saw or heard the dog men if somebody saw them they'd saddle up ride to the neighbors uh who would saddle up and ride to the next neighbors etc cetera, etc cetera, until there were spies all over the hills monitoring all the activities of the hunters um and the cedar choppers eventually decided to take matters into their own hands to solve this problem, as they often did. And they started shooting these hunting dogs. Well, eventually, they shot the wrong dog. The wrong dog was a prized hunting dog from Kentucky that one of the Hill brothers owned. One of the hunters described this situation as, quote, being ambushed by blankety-blank hillbillies who pay no taxes, close quote, which is how they would refer to the cedar choppers sometimes. The hunters offered a reward for information on who might have done this, but as you might expect, not a single person volunteered any information. Well, finally, law enforcement made an arrest, and the guy they arrested was named Paul Wechter, and I'm going to spell it W-A-E-C-H-T-E-R. I'm going to pronounce it Wechter. That's my best um, half-German attempt. Um, now, you notice that's a German name. So it was not uncommon for these Appalachian migrants to, to uh, marry into the German families in the area and vice versa. So you'll see, uh, if you do more research on the cedar choppers, some German influence for sure. Well, they charged Mr. Wechter with killing multiple dogs, but uh, ultimately took him to trial on only one. Over 100 witnesses were subpoenaed for this case, for this trial. So obviously, this was a big deal. This case was being pushed very hard. Um, of the over 100 witnesses subpoenaed, not a single witness would give negative testimony against Paul Wechter. Finally, Wechter's younger brother said that, in fact, on the stand, yes, in answer to a question, he had seen a dead dog out in the hills, but he reckoned it had been hooked by a buck deer. So that trial was going nowhere fast. Um, they ended up finding Wechter, amazingly enough, guilty and giving him a fine but that's all they did, and that, of course, was to mollify the Austin hunters. Later, that fine was waived, so Wechter got off scot-free. Um, and as you might imagine, it was waived, likely because the fear was the cedar choppers might decide to quit shooting the dogs and start shooting the hunters. Um, incidentally, Wechter was known by everybody in the hills as a crack shot and a very tough man, despite having only one arm. That's correct. He had lost an arm. Imagine what he would have been able to do with two. Well, that time period was known as the Travis County Dog Wars. Wechter, incidentally, went on to become a city official in Austin. He met his end when he was hit by a car in South Austin on the Montopolis Bridge. So, in a way, Austin's progress finally got him. Well, eventually, the Cedar Chopper's way of life slowly declined and went away. Gas started heating homes instead of wood. The city of Austin expanded into the hills. You could buy charcoal at HEB. The land to the west became the suburbs. But for a while, you could visit Appalachia in Austin and the cedar choppers. <laughs>
Well, now we come to the part of the episode I call Getting There, where I tell you where you can see a couple of the places I talk about in the episode. I uh, want to tell you about uh, the Ains School. Now, a- the Ains School District is going to be well known to anybody listening to this podcast who lives in Austin. Uh, Robert Ains, in 1872, founded a school called, appropriately, the Ains School. And uh, that's where a lot of these Cedar Chopper kids would go to school and and often would be first generation to get any kind of education. Uh, Ains Elementary School is on the location of the original Ains School. Um, Now, I want to take a a moment and talk about the city of Westlake Hills. Now, this is a very famous uh, state champions multiple times, and including uh, current state champions in high school football. Westlake Hills was founded by Emmett Shelton, who was a lawyer, and and Shelton represented some of these cedar choppers when they'd get into some uh, legal entanglements, shall we say. And uh, he ended up founding Westlake Hills, and all that land over there was uh, where you would find the cedar choppers. In fact, in Colorado Bend State Park, there's a cedar chopper trail, uh, which was, in fact, a cedar chopper trail. So when you're driving around looking at those big houses in Rolling Wood and Westlake Hills and that area in Cedar Park, uh, you're in Cedar Chopper territory. Um, The Tom Miller Dam across uh, the Colorado River west of downtown Austin was built in the 30s. It opened in 1940, and it was one of the dams that would have isolated the west side. But right in that area, uh, if you'd cross the river, you'd be right in that Cedar Chopper territory. So next time you drive across Tom Miller Dam or or south of it, you'll drive on uh, Redbud Trail, I think is the street, or Redbud. You're driving right into Cedar Chopper territory. Um, In Cedar Park, the suburb of Cedar Park, there's a historical marker about the Cedar Chopping industry. It's at uh, 10316 Staked Plains Drive in Cedar Park. And that marker sits on top of where an old cedar camp was. Those choppers would chop cedar, move their camp, chop some more, etc. And uh, on that, on one of those camps is where they put that marker. So you can see it. Um, I don't do this often on the podcast, but I do want to mention the book that I referenced earlier because it is the uh, book on the cedar choppers, and it is called The Cedar Choppers. And uh, The Cedar Choppers is Life on the Edge of Nothing written by Ken Roberts. Uh, It is still in print. It's on its, I don't even know, fifth or sixth printing probably. Uh, Came out in 2018. It's a fantastic work that details uh, the Cedar Chopper community and uh, certainly commend it to your reading if you find that of interest. And now that I'm saying it out loud, I probably ought to get in touch with Mr. Roberts and get him on the podcast. Well, that wraps it up for another episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you so much for tuning in for your dose of Texas history. Hope everybody uh, has a good summer. And uh, if you want to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history, you can go to patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at wiseabouttexas. And if you get a minute, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps people find the show. Thanks again for listening. Go out and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.